Chapter 7 of The Giver, page 50 for me. Now Jonas's group had taken a new place in the auditorium, trading with the new eleven, so that they sat in the very front immediately before the stage. They were arranged by their original numbers, the numbers they had been given at birth. The numbers were rarely used after the naming, but each child knew his number, of course. Sometimes parents used them in irritation at a child's misbehavior, indicating that mischief made one unworthy of a name. Jonas always chuckled when he heard a parent, exasperated, call sharply to a whining toddler. That's enough, 23! Now, in our society, we don't use numbers, but you know whenever you're in trouble. It's typically your first name and your middle name. When I was a kid, if I heard Rebecca Lynn, I knew that I should probably shape up. Jonas was 19. He had been the 19th new child born his year. It had meant that at his naming, he had been already standing and bright-eyed, soon to walk and talk. It had given him a slight advantage the first year or two, a little more maturity than many of his groupmates who had been born in the later months of that year. But it evened out, as it always did, by three. After three, the children progressed at much the same level, though by their first number, one could always tell who was a few months older than the others in his group. Technically, Jonas's full number was 1119, since there were other 19s, of course, in each age group. And today, now that the new 11s had been advanced that morning, there were two 1119s. At the midday break, he had exchanged smiles with a new one, a shy female named Harriet. But the duplication was only for these few hours. Very soon, he would not be an 11, but a 12, and age would no longer matter. He would be an adult, like his parents, though a new one and untrained still. Twelve. That's sixth grade, and they're having these kids choose what their profession... Well, sorry, they're not choosing their profession. They're assigning them their profession, and that's where their training comes from. Imagine a sixth grader being considered an adult. That's insane. Asher was four and sat now in the row ahead of Jonas. He would receive his assignment fourth. Fiona, 18, was on his left, and on his other side sat, a tw sat 20, a male named Pierre, whom Jonas did not like very much. And also there's that disjoint, a male, a female. It seems very impersonal whenever he's calling them those things. Pierre was very serious, not much fun, and a worrier and a tattletale too. Have you checked the rules, Jonas? Pierre was always whispering solemnly. I am not sure that's within the rules. Usually it was some foolish thing that no one cared about, opening his tunic if it was a day with a breeze, taking a brief try on a friend's bicycle, just to experience the different feel of it. The initial speech at the ceremony of twelve was made by the chief elder, the leader of the community, who was elected every ten years. The speech was much the same each year, recollection of the time of childhood and the period of preparation, the coming responsibilities of adult life, the profound importance of assignment, the seriousness of training to come. And then the chief elder moved ahead in her speech. This is the time she began looking directly at them. When we acknowledge differences, you 11s have spent all your years until now learning to fit in, to standardize your behavior, to curb any impulse that might set you apart from the group. But today, we honor your differences. They have determined your future. So we talked about that a little bit, and that word is conformity. And typically, that's what the society wants, is they want them to conform. That's why their hair is cut the same way. That's why they get their bicycles the same day. That's why they all turn a year older on the same day. That word is conformity. And now they're saying, we're celebrating your differences. That way we can give you a new job in this community, because everybody does need a different job. That's how the community is going to work and survive. She began to describe this year's group and its variety of personalities, though she sig sig sorry, signal singled <laughs> no one out by name. She mentioned that there was one who had singular skills at caretaking, another who loved new children, one with unusual scientific aptitude, and a fourth for whom physical labor was an obvious pleasure. Jonas shifted in his seat, trying to recognize each reference of one of his groupmates. The caretaking skills were no doubt those of Fiona. On his left, he remembered noticing the tenderness with which she had bathed the old. Remember, that's who Asher was bathing that old guy with, okay, and we thought it was kind of weird. That's just the way it is in that society. It's not a big deal there. Probably the one with scientific aptitude was Benjamin, the male who had devised new important equipment for the rehabilitation center. He heard nothing that he recognizes himself, Jonas. 
Finally, the chief elder paid tribute to the hard work of her committee, which had performed the observation so meticulously all year. The committee of elders stood and was acknowledged by applause. Jonas noticed Asher yawned slightly, covering his mouth politely with his hand. And then at last, the chief elder called number one to the stage and the assignments began. Each announcement was lengthy, accompanied by a speech directed at the new 12. Jonas tried to pay attention as one, smiling happily, received her assignment as fish hatchery attendant, along with words of praise for her childhood spent during many volunteer hours there, and her obvious interest in the important process of providing nourishment for the community. And again, sorry, number one, her name is Madeline, returned, finally amidst applause to her seat, wearing the new badge that designated her fish hatchery attendant. Jonas was certainly glad that that assignment was taken. He would not have wanted it, but he gave Madeline a smile and a congratulations. When two, a female named Inger, received her assignment as birth mother, Jonas remembered that his mother had called it a job without honor but he thought that the committee had chosen well. Inger was a nice girl, though somewhat lazy, and her body was strong. She would enjoy the three years of being pampered that would follow her brief training. She would give birth easily and well, and the task of labor that would follow could use her strength, keep her healthy, and impose self-discipline. Inger was smiling when she resumed her seat. Birth mother was an important job, if lacking in prestige. Okay, now remember, they don't have babies the way that we do, we're still unsure of how that happens at this point in time in the novel. But I think that if I'm remembering correctly, these women have two babies and they go on to become laborers. And by laborers, I mean people who are out working hard jobs, like construction workers. And it's a very physical and meaningful job to have. Jonas noticed that Asher looked nervous. He kept turning his head and glancing back at Jonas until the group leader had to give him a silent chastisement. You know what a silent chastisement is. Whenever mom or Miss Sandusky looks at you, like, knock it off. Okay, it's that look. A motion to sit still and face forward. Three, Isaac was given an assignment of instructor of sixes, which obviously pleased him and was well deserved. Now, there were three assignments gone. None of them that Jonas would have liked, not that he could have been a birth mother anyways. But he realized with amusement, as he tried to sort through the list in his mind, that what possible assignments still remained. There were so many that it, he gave it, sorry, but there were so many that he gave up. And anyway, now it was Asher's turn. He paid strict attention as his friend went to the stage and stood self-consciously beside the chief elder. What do you think Asher's going to be? Remember, he's kind of crazy. He's not very organized. Um, he's clumsy. So be thinking about what could possibly be Asher's assignment. All of us in the community know and enjoy Asher, the chief elder began. Asher grinned and scratched one leg with the other foot, and the audience chuckled softly, so obviously there is love for Asher here. When the committee began to consider Asher's assignment, she went on, there were some possibilities, possibilities that were immediately discarded, some that would clearly not have been right for Asher. For example, she said, smiling, they did not consider for an instant designating Asher as an instructor of threes. The audience howled with laughter. Asher laughed too, looking sheepish, but pleased with the special attention. Well, because really she's kind of embarrassing him, right? By pointing out his flaws, which isn't right. The instructor of threes were in charge of acquisition of correct language. In fact, the chief elder continued chuckling a little to herself. We gave a little thought as to some retroactive chastisement for the one who had been Asher's instructor of three so long ago. At the meeting where Asher was discussed, we retold many of the stories that we all remember from his days of language acquisition. Again, just poking. Especially, she said, chuckling, the difference between snack and smack. Remember Asher? Asher nodded ruefully, and the audience laughed aloud. Jonas said too, he remembered, though he had only been a three at the time himself. The punishment used for small children with Sorry, this, bo this part bothers me. The punishment used for small children was a regulated system of smacks with a discipline wand, a thin, flexible weapon that stung painfully when it was wielded. The child care specialists were trained very carefully in the discipline methods, a quick smack across the hands for a bit of minor misbehavior, three sharper smacks on the bare legs for a second offense. So they're using corporal punishment here. If you don't know what that is, that's physical punishment for misbehavior. Poor Asher, who always talked too fast and mixed up words, even as a toddler, as a three, eager for his juice and crackers at snack time, he one day said smack instead of snack as he stood waiting in line for the morning treat. Jonas remembered it clearly. 
He could still see a little Ashy wiggling with impatience in line. He remembered the cheerful voice yelling out, I want my snack! The other threes, including Jonas, had laughed nervously. Snack, they corrected. You meant snack, Asher. But the mistake had been made. Imposition of language was one of the most important tasks of small children. Asher had asked for smack. The discipline wand in the hand of the child care worker whistled as it came down across Asher's hands. Asher whimpered, cringed, corrected himself instantly. Smack, he whispered. Some kids develop differently than others. You see that with you and your peers. And a lot of times, M's and N's and P's and even R's are hard for kids to say, um, let alone at the age of three. So these kids are being punished for developmental issues that they really have no control over. And that really hurts my feelings. It hurts my heart to even read something like that. But the next morning, he had done it again and again the following week. He couldn't seem to stop, though for each lapse, the disciplined wand came again, escalating to a series of painful lashes that left marks on Asher's legs. Eventually, for a period of time, Asher stopped talking altogether when he was a three. For a while, the chief elder said, relating the story, we had a silent Asher, but he learned. So that's her talking now at the age of 12 and still kind of like poking fun about this. She turned to him with a smile. When he began to talk again, it was with greater precision. And now his lapses are very few. His corrections and apologies are very prompt and his good humor is unfailing. The audience murmured in agreement. Asher's cheerful disposition was well known throughout the community. Asher, she lifted her voice to make the official announcement. We have given you the assignment of assistant director of recreation. She clipped on his new badge as he stood beside her, beaming, and then he turned and left the stage as the audience cheered. When he had taken his seat again, the chief elder looked down at him and said the words that she had said four times, and now would say to each new twelve. Somehow she had given it special meaning for each of them. Asher, thank you for your childhood. The assignments continued, and Jonas watched and listened, relieved now by the wonderful assignment his best friend had been given. But... He was more and more apprehensive as his own approach. Now the new twelves in the row ahead of him had all received their badges. They were fingering them as they sat, and Jonas knew that each one was thinking about the training that lay ahead. For some, one studious male had been selected as doctor, a female as engineer, and another for law and justice. It would be years of hard work and study. Others, like laborers and birth mothers, would have a much shorter training period. 18, Fiona on his left, was called. Jonas knew she had to be nervous, but Fiona was a calm female. She had been sitting quietly, serenely throughout the ceremony. Even the applause, though enthusiastic, seemed serene when Fiona was given the importance, sorry, the important assignment of caretaker of the old. It was perfect for such a sensitive, gentle girl, and her smile was satisfied and pleased when she took her seat beside him again. Jonas prepared himself to walk to the stage when the applause ended and the chief elder picked up the next folder and looked down to the group to call forward the next new 12. He was calm now that it was his turn and it had to come. He took a deep breath and smoothed his hair with his hand. 20, he heard her voice say clearly. Pierre. She skipped me, Jonas thought, stunned. Had he heard wrong? No. There was a sudden hush in the crowd, and he knew that the entire community realized that the chief elder had moved from 18 to, one, to 20, leaving a gap. On his, on, his, sorry, on his right, Pierre, with a startled look, rose from his seat and moved to the stage. A mistake! She made a mistake! But Jonas knew, even as he had had the thought that she didn't, the chief elder made no mistakes, not at the ceremony of 12. He felt dizzy. He couldn't focus atten his attention. He didn't hear what assignment Pierre received, and he was only dimly aware of the applause as the boy turned wearing his new badge. Then 21, 22, the numbers continued in order. Jonas sat dazed as they moved into the 30s and then the 40s. Nearing the end, each time of the, each announcement, his heart jumped for a moment, and he thought with wild thoughts. Perhaps now she would call his name. Could he have forgotten his own number? No, he'd always been 19. He was sitting in the seat marked 19, but she'd skipped him. He saw the others in his group glance at him, embarrassed, and then avert their eyes quickly. He saw a worried look on the face of his group leader. He hunched his shoulders and 
try to make himself smaller in the seats. He wanted to disappear, to fade away, not to exist. He didn't dare to turn and find his parents in the crowd. He couldn't bear to see their faces darken with shame. Jonas bowed his head and searched through his own mind. What had he done wrong? 